Hello, everyone. This is Michael Rochelle from Brandon Hall Group. Glad you can join us today. Um, very pleased to have Dennis and Matt and Graham join me today. I'm just waiting for the slides to be able to catch up with us, I believe. And then we can get, can everyone see our slides? And there they are. See that? The magic of technology. That is our first version of Gen AI. We actually just literally created all of those slides by just saying that one thing. So, so let me uh, do more formal announcements. I'm Mike Rochelle. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer, Principal Analyst here at Brand Hall Group. I'm joined by Graham Glass, who's the CEO of Site for Learning, who's also sponsoring this webinar. And we'll give a big shout out and thank you. We have Dennis Denoya, who's the founder of Mr. D Math, who has some extremely interesting insights on this topic. And Matt Downing is going to give us the CMO and CIO look from MedPower. So welcome, gentlemen. And our moderator, Matt Pittman, is one of our principal analysts, will be taking your chat information. So let's go through a few housekeeping slides, and then we can get started. So again, thank you, Site for Learning for sponsoring the webinar. We also have a variety of things that we do at Brandon Hall Group. You all have a copy of this webinar link and the deck to talk about things afterwards, but we're always happy to host great conversations like this. We encourage you to take a look at our surveys. This is how we generate a lot of dialogue that we have on our round tables and webinars. We have several open. So as a respondent, we also share with you the data and insights so you can benchmark against other organizations. So how do you work with us during this session? Chat's wide open. Matt will be fielding chat questions, dropping them right into our discussion in real time. Just go ahead and drop it in the question box. We'll also be making the presentation available as well. And if you can give us any opportunity to allow us to answer your questions. We'd love that. So we've kind of taken a look on our next slide. What we're trying to accomplish today are the questions that we posed in our abstract that you signed up for, which is what is generative AI? How is generative AI applied to learning? What can the right generative AI power technology transform learning? And what are the critical steps, which I think is a really super important point. We also ask you to give you an opportunity and add to that question list during the registration process. We kind of took a look at that. And there's a lot of good questions that I think we're going to dive right into. And first and foremost, will generative AI eliminate jobs? That's a third rail question, but an important one. We're trying to recognize and address bias in AI generated content, very popular subject in our research as well. How do we not infringe on copyright? So how do we know what we're creating is unique and how do we address providing the appropriate referencing, which is kind of a coupled conversation. We want to make sure it doesn't produce inaccurate results, which we'll get into that in one of our survey questions. We want to make sure that we can use it for all types of training tools. What's interesting is the one where it accelerates staff engagement and learning and transfer to on-the-job performance. I think you're going to find that Site for Learning is excellent at doing that. And then we have to get that cybersecurity team support involved. IT needs to be involved as well. And we want to be able to get that upskilling and reskilling at scale. That would be terrific opportunity for Gen AI. And then finally, a really good question is the landscape for certifications. And that actually just recently came up in a client conversation I had the other day. So that is the list. So I'm going to turn it over to the team and say, where do we want to jump in and how do we get the dialogue going? Uh, I can I can address the what is generative AI. It's, it's a good place to start because there's a lot of misunderstanding of what that actually is. So generative AI, as it's currently implemented by majority of companies, including OpenAI, Anthropic, et cetera, um, uses a, a kind of advanced technology based on neural nets. And what it does is that it scours, currently most of the data comes from the internet and extracts structure and patterns. And some of those patterns are quite simple and some of these patterns are really quite deep. So it starts to extract 
the true meaning of what it's ingesting. And it doesn't remember anything like a copy and paste. It's taking the entire internet and codifying it into a set of numbers that represents the structures that it's found. And that's the so-called large language model. And then they build an interface over that, which is what most people have used, the, you know, the chat GBT, for example, where you can ask it a question and it extracts the meaning of your question and responds with something suitable. And the one last thing I'd like to mention is not only can it ask a question, but it can do stuff as well. So for example, my first experience with chat GBT and Dr. You know, Mr. Math will enjoy this. I said, what's two plus two? That was literally my <laughs> first interaction, four. Okay, good. But then I started getting into now teach me linear algebra. And it started actually prompting and having a conversation with me. So that's that's how I, you know, but if you ask chat GBT, where did you get that from? It doesn't remember. It just it got extracted, but does not remember the source. And that's a key thing. Yeah, you, you know, as you, as you you look at that, one thing that I found with uh, when you're using something like chat GPT is you have to be willing to verify information and it it uh, it's still working on math equations. And that's that's really funny because there are math equations. We'll ask it to create something and we go in and verify the information that we're looking at. But what it does is it creates the context for what we're looking at. So oftentimes it's like we're it's creating the background of what we're trying to create what we're looking at and we do have to go back in and, and check some of the some of the calculations so um but again it you know it's learning and that's the that's it, we're all learning right and I, but I, it's interesting to watch the system itself learning as it starts to get better so you know we are going in and looking at things and having to go in and verify but what it does is it gives us such a head start on what we're creating and what we're doing and like Graham just said it's like you know, you can ask it, you can start a conversation literally because th there's things you haven't thought of that the that the AI is going to ask you that takes you deeper into what you're trying to get to. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. It's it's not really a a a, a hunt and find kind of apparatus. The, by my experience, it's those conversations that have provided the most valuable results, no doubt. So let's get to the heart of what what brought us all together. So. Gen AI is a wonderment, definitely. I mean, where it's just permeated our complete lives in, in every aspect. But how do we make it be that friend and not foe? I'm, I'm sure I speak for many learning and development professionals, like even the top question, is it a job elimination? Is it a tool for me? Does it augment? How do I apply it to learning? All these great questions around how do I make sure I use it properly and not step on anybody's toes, not infringe any copyright? How do we, how do we as a group get our audience to say that this is a friendly, fast moving, groundbreaking, mm -hmm. shake you to your shoes, but it's, <laughs> but it's a friendly approach to, to, to doing things. Yeah. Now, I, I like uh, Google's uh, description of you go to Bard and, and you, you start to make your prompts. Uh, the first thing they have there is your creative and helpful collaborator here to supercharge your imagination, boost your productivity, and bring your ideas to life. And I thought that was like a, a great way to introduce the, the possibilities of, of what you can do with, with generative AI and really encourages you to explore and, and, uh, and have some fun with it. Yeah, I mean, I one, so I use JetGBT every single day now. And I'll give you an example outside of the enterprise, because I know we're going to be talking about the enterprise a lot very soon. But I'm a home recording enthusiast. And I've got a very specific setup. It's a Roland Phantom 8 keyboard. It's, it's Apple Logic. It's Apollo ADE converter, but very specific set of gear. And the way that I used to figure out how to use it is I'd go into Google and I would say, how do you do this on the Phantom 8? And I'd find some user manual and I'd read the user manual and I'd go back to Google and say, how do you do? And I have to piece together so much information from so many different places. It would take hours. But the interesting thing is when it ingested the internet, it ingested all the user manuals for the Roland Phantom 8 and Apollo Log uh, Apple Logic and the Apollo. So what I do, I say, hey, chat GBT, how do I connect my Phantom to this thing and diagnose such and such an issue? And it gives you the specific example to my specific case within seconds. And 
So what I found is that when I'm trying to learn something, generative AI is an amazing accelerant versus anything that I've used before. So the obvious thing is, well, if it can help me in my everyday out of work lives, imagine what it can do inside of my work. So I really do think that generative AI can greatly reduce the time to wanting to know something and knowing it. And Dennis, let me let me ask you something in particular from from your perspective. Do you think it's hard to use generative AI, or is it just a lot of practice in terms oh. of developing learning? Yeah, no, I think it's actually easy. Um, and the reason why I say it's easy is that if you you think about when you're collaborating. And oftentimes, if you're creating content, you're creating the context for the content and you're doing the work yourself, sometimes you can kind of get lost and, you know, wandering down. You're not sure if you're going the right direction, but it's more like you're building a relationship with the generative AI so that, you know, uh, oftentimes, too, you get in a conversation with somebody and we're afraid of we might sound funny because we're going to ask the wrong question and we're not going to sound like we're, we know what we talk, we're, we're talking about, but with, with working with AI, they don't, AI doesn't judge, you know, it's actually one of those places that it is easy to use because you're just starting a dialogue and you're creating a conversation. You're saying, Hey, I need to know about, tell me about this or tell me about that. And then it comes back and it's, then you're training the AI inside of what you're doing. So it it really comes from, the, for me, it's that collaboration. I, I find it very, very easy to use and supportive because it's like, I don't get judged for what I'm asking. <laughs> Not only that, but it, you know, the subject matter expertise you get, it is, certainly for a smaller company is invaluable. I mean, it's like having a, a research assistant who's also got degrees in English and also has a degree in graphic design. Um, they're at your disposal being that partner. So I, I agree. It's it's a fantastic tool um, to be able to apply, especially when you want to try to build individualized content. Graham's talking about for himself, but in our industry, when we're trying to teach doctors and nurses how to use complex systems, making it more individualized is really where the rubber hits the road for us. Being relevant, whether it's by your facility, your geography, uh, your particular role at the hospital, Right now, it's it's too hard for us to to bring that down to the individual user level. But as we explore with the opportunities that generative AI produces for us, we can start to build these customized courses and content like never before. It's it's really it's it's almost too hard to imagine what the possibilities are and trying to break it off into meaningful, uh, realistic chunks so that we can have those successes and start to convince everyone else in the team how it can be used. Yeah, and I, it's, I echo what you guys are saying about how personalized it is. And you can imagine in the near future where if somebody wants to learn something and they're not getting a personalized experience, it will seem very old fashioned. It's like, don't keep on Great just point. giving me the same can stuff. I want it for me. And, you know, I like I say, I, I learn way more stuff nowadays through ChatGBT than I do through Google, for example. Now, let's talk about so, that. Matt, you... You mentioned something about Gen AI having graphic design capabilities. We had a question come in about that, uh, just asking how that works. Can you talk a little bit more about your experience with that? Sure. Um, we're B two B providers, so a lot of the uh, design work we do, you know, might be creating illustrations and bringing data to, to life. So I think there's a lot of uh, good. Uh, information about how to leverage generative AI to produce charts and graphs. We're trying to take it a step further um, and produce visuals to complement our learning. So as we go into different learning modules that um, hit on, on specific, in our case, uh, departments at a hospital, creating graphics and imagery that uh, pertain to that, just help pull them through the story. And you know, we always talk about like chapters in a book. And it's always nice to really see what that path looks like ahead of you. So we try to complement not just the words, but with images so that at a, um, uh, you know, looking at all of the different modules or sections in a course, they can, it's a telling a story that complements the content that's in the story. So we're using um, a couple of different, we're still experimenting with the best way to get it. Um, but we, you know, whether it's Dolly or, or some of the other programs, we've, 
trying to figure out what's going to create a, um, a thematic visual approach for our brands. Um, and that's one place that, you know, I'm looking for some feedback and information, like how do you keep that voice more consistent? And that's one place we're experimenting visually. Yeah, we, we're using Stability AI as our, our primary AI for generating imagery for courses, because we have the Cypher Copilot, which obviously we invest a lot of time right now into building advanced courses from scratch using AI. And the 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 core sections, they all, you know, anyone can customize the imagery. And, and in the past, people would typically go into the net and find photographs. You're never quite sure, do you have copyright to them or do you need to use stock photos or what do you do? And uh, so one of the things that we added with, which I think was a great option is when you build a course, it just says generate synthetic imagery. And if you check that box, then all of those tiles now are generated through prompts to stability AI. So that's an example of how we're, we're using it in our automated course development tool. But there's um, there's tons of other ways that you can you know generate images. And Graham, when you're doing that and you're making a call for images through stability at one time, is it building those as a series that might be connected or are those each individual yeah, calls? Yeah, so, so the way it works is that, so, uh, so we are, Copilot uses multiple AIs, it's not just one. And they all have their own specialties. So as it's organizing the course and coming up with the course flow, each module is chained together in terms of a natural flow for, from an educational perspective. And as it's generating them, you can ask one AI to say, hey, what prompt would you pass on to another AI to build an image for this module about X? And so one AI says, well, I would use this. And then you take that and you feed it into the next AI, which then generates the image and puts them in. And then if a human likes it, great. If the human doesn't like it, they can click a button and replace it with something else. Yeah, and I'm I'm a I've been using the Copilot um, through Cipher Learning, and it's a tool, I, and that's the best way to say um, how it what it works for us. But you know, I'm, I've been a, um, in education for 35 years, and a curriculum developer, and you know, one of the biggest things is a content provider. And one of the things that we always come up with against is when you're writing uh, quiz quiz questions and when you're writing a, you're creating assessments is making the distractors in a in some in a standardized format of, of assessments it's a lot of work it's a lot of thought it's a lot of you know every word you have to like you really are paying attention to each word on the page and what it looks like and using a program like copilot like we're using right now we're able to create all of that. And then what we're able to do is go back and review it as opposed to be at the source of creating it. We're not, we're actually reviewing it, looking at it, seeing what we like, what we don't like. As Graham just said, it's like, you know, the, the human side is if we like it, we're going to use it. If we don't, we can modify it. And it has been, uh, it's a game changer really, because it's taking uh, taking a lot of the, um, for me, it's taking a, a lot of the the day-to-day -day kind of like wearing my brain cells down, right? Kind of like getting the tired of like you know, the thinking, right? Yeah. yeah. Where it's, I can look at it from at the top view where I'm looking in and now I can provide, I can provide the leadership as opposed to being the one that's kind of like doing, you know, creating all the work in the, in the right. background. Yeah, it's really great. And it's like, we, we use Copilot to then version courses. So you using, using that content as a seed and then iterating off that. So it's been super helpful that way. Right. Yeah, we're taking our own, our own content we already have. And it's like, what can AI provide that we didn't think of? You know, because we thought of everything we thought of, but there's even more. It's, it's that, you know, that the synergy, right? It's like, you know, two two heads are better than one, right? But you're creating that that third, uh, that third opinion that is always more than either person could come up with on their own. And now it's kind of like the AI with HI coming together, like that artificial intelligence with human intelligence and the partnership is uh, something to me it's like we're at just the very beginning of this but what does it look like and how does it right. how does it open doors that we haven't didn't even know the doors were there like we can get to them now yeah because I, yeah. I had one eye-opening experience so when we released the first version i remembered well i used to be a professor i used to teach computer science at ut dallas and just like every other l d person any instructor i built the course myself and it was a long, like to build the first version of my course, which was Unix and C, was a long slog and there's like long hours and um, wasn't, wasn't particularly pleasant, but I, but I made it my own. It had lots of 
personal anecdotes and projects that I liked, et cetera. So I remember we released the first version. I thought, well, I wonder what it would build my old, old course. So I, cause I'm an expert, domain expert, so I can easily tell. So I, you build me a course on Unix and C, targeted adults. I want it to be in a professional tone of voice, you know, if, and, and I, I would give it a little few instructions, like nudges, like, and remember to also include a project about X, you know, and then what it generated was actually amazingly good. It wasn't a polished product, you know, like I would have made some changes, which I would have done if it, if I'd been a, uh, still a professor, but it did 80% of that drudgery really, really well. So now rather than spending 400 hours, like you were saying, Dennis, creating stuff from scratch, I can spend like 20 hours polishing it and making it mine. So, um, but yeah, I, I reviewed it as a domain expert. It did, it did a really, really good job. Yeah. You, you touched on a really important point. You know, the, the opportunity to reduce burnout, depending on your organization, that's huge. If you can, you can cut that stress and, and have people focus on the students in the classroom, the people in, in your, um, your training room. That, that makes all the difference and your focus is going to be there and you're going to provide the added value by covering those basics and getting getting that platform set up now let's get let's get focused on this now so we've got the content that we used to create we have the content that we need to create we have content that's existing outside of the organization content that exists inside the organization we know what our endpoint is most of the time how do we make that all work? How do we deal with some of the questions that people are asking? How do we root out the bias? Or how do we make sure that we're not going to wake up and find out that 50% of what we put into our, you know, our learning from the outside is belongs to somebody else? Like, how are we managing what I would call the governance around all of this? Yeah. And Graham, particularly for you, you know, how does Cypher Learning kind of work through all of that so that you get the best of? Yeah, so I'll address some of them, and you know the other panelists can address some of the other ones. But um, I know that we, we've evolved quite quickly in our use of AI, and the Copilot one uh, uses the public domain knowledge, everything up until twenty twenty two, and that actually serves a huge percentage of content that needs to be generated. And how do I know that? Because we work with tons of early access people, and they say. Well, you know, in my l and we're tasked with building five courses about digital survival skills. Can you help doing that? So it wasn't based on proprietary stuff. And even if there was a proprietary angle, you would generate 80% of it, and then you would go in and edit and add your own cultural references and your own special stuff. So using the knowledge of the entire internet can get you a long way. But that being said, though, there are a lot of people who, especially training providers, l and and they say, well, the, this version of the course is a PDF and this course is a PowerPoint and this course is a document. And so the next step is how can you create a course based on your internal proprietary data, which is in format one? Maybe it's not the best organized. It doesn't have quizzes. It's not competency based learning. It's not gamified, but it has the main content. So coming out next week, uh, Copilot 2, you'll be able to upload a video or a PDF or a PowerPoint or a document. Word document, and it essentially extracts this private information. Mm. It keeps it private. Uh, any of the companies that we use their AIs, they have a data privacy statement that anything you send through the API is completely private. And these are massive companies, so they would lose a lot of money if they violated that. And then so, so that kind of addresses the step two, which is building courses out of individual documents Step three, which is actually going to be coming out in 2024, is where you enlarge on that and you have a corporate knowledge base of lots and lots of documents that represent different portions of what you want to teach. And then use an AI to say, build me a course in X and you can draw upon any of these documents in my knowledge base. So that's what we're doing in terms of moving from only using public to individual documents to knowledge base. And I'll, I'll build on that as, as we we principally use a lot of our own content and video content is, is one of the things that we're going to be focused on uh, moving up. But the course length has been an interesting experiment for us. So oftentimes we just keep adding our own content and courses just start to get bloated. 
And where it's really interesting is challenging AI to bring that down to something more manageable. Get it, get it to a more micro learning format, get me um, to a point where I can better engage people who aren't gonna be able to spend that amount of time on a course. That, that's really been hugely valuable for us and having more uh, efficient use of your words and, and your, your images, et cetera. Yeah, in fact, that, that is one thing I wanna mention. And that is, that was one of the things we built into version one was micro learning format which I, I love my, it's like bite-sized learning and it's just picture and a paragraph, click next, picture and a paragraph. And so especially the modern learners, they kind of like that snack size stuff. So you could say, build me a course about digital survival skills and one course is long form and then build me a micro learning form and it would generate a different course using micro learning. So on the on the topic of different learning formats and types, we did get a we had a question come up a little bit ago about using AI to help learners get a personalized learning experience in a in an instructor led environment or in a planned learning experience. Any thoughts around maybe how to incorporate that AI generative AI in the live learning experience? Yeah, so we're going to be releasing that in Q1. <laughs> so, uh, you know, taking a step back, you know, our feeling was the most obvious place for us to apply our engineering resources mm -hmm. was creation of educational content for L&D teams to make it way easier mm -hmm. for them to deal with their backlog and generating fresh new material and more modern material. And, and there are, you know, there's building on public, there's building on private. So there's a a collection of features which is targeted for the instructor, the L&D team. But the second area that we're really interested in is on the, is directly to the learner. And, you know, why would we do that? Well, if, if I look at how I spend my day, I use ChatGPT all the time to teach me things. I want to learn something quickly. I don't need to bother an L&D person and say, can you create me a, you know, multi-hour course? I just want the answer right now. And we're a little tutorial or chat with an AI expert. So that's why in Q1 of next year, we're going to be releasing the first version of our Gen AI targeted to learners. And the general idea there is that it'll just say, what do you want to learn? And it can be based on a problem you are having in an instructor-led course, or it can be nothing to do with the instructor. You just sit down at your laptop and you go, hey, how do I build a digital icon for in the pharmaceutical industry? And it would just give you instructions on how to do that. In our, Matt, uh, it was an interesting question because in, in our business, we, we do a lot of hybrid learning. So we'll do a lot of online learning for the basics, the foundational pieces, you know, how to use an electronic health record system. But where we've been a experimenting with AI is in generating those uh, in-person, the supplemental trainings for in-person, whether that's self-directed uh, learning and exercises they might do or classroom exercises. So just, just keeping it interesting, keeping it uh, fresh uh, is difficult to do. So if you've got a group of, in our example, nurses in, in the room, that might look one way. Uh, you got doctors coming into the room the next hour, it's going to look a little bit different. So it's really helpful in iterating uh, that in-person content to complement the course. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we look at it too from um, adaptive learning. And you know, for, for us, it's like we're a company that does math courses, right? And we work with work with young people and young people come in all different levels when they come to us and when they're you know using the program maybe they're working at a, a level of an algebra one level but they weren't quite ready and so how do we get them there and so that's another piece of the ai which customizes it for this user and for the student because when they see that they're not successful with a particular topic or competency then we can actually create the ai content to adapt their learning so we can get them so they can get up to speed on that and that right now is immensely, you know, for us, is immensely huge because we haven't had the manpower to go in and create all that on our own, but we can use AI to generate the content so that when a student does get to a place where they need additional support, it automatically takes them there. And that is for us, that, that again is another, it's a game changer. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a second from a game changer standpoint is who, who's willing to put on the table how much time you're actually saving? Years. 
<laughs> you okay. know, for, for us, it, well, I can tell you, like for us to create a, uh, you know, to create a course, it takes us about 12 months to create a course from start to finish from the time that we're writing the, writing the curriculum, writing the quizzes, testing it, editing, and the editing is huge. Uh, it's a funny thing about when you go back to edit, especially math equations, you know, and you're in there and, you know, you missed the slightest thing. There was an X, but you put a Y. There was a, there was an exponent, you put a three and there was a two. It, it, there's so much of the editing that goes back in that, that, that's that over the course of a year, but we're writing quiz questions. We're writing the test questions. We're writing the content, the practice problems, the solutions to the practice problems. We're creating the videos and the editing of the videos. It is an immense project. And when I say game changer in the course of a year, it's like we can create the content. And then what we're doing is refining it where we're bringing the content to match our brand. So then we're personalizing it to what it looks like, what our customers are used to seeing from us. Because they love our programs. They just want more. And now we can now we can deliver more. Yeah. And I don't know if it's so much the, the time savings as it's more efficient use of the time you do have. I don't know about everybody else, but I never have enough time. And... <laughs> I, I'm like a, the fishbowl, you know, I'll, I'll just grow to the size of whatever my, I can. And I think this is where you just get, you can squeeze so much more out of the time you've got uh, having this, this tool set available to you. Yeah. Let's talk I'll, about the, H, the, the HI piece. And Graham, I think you can weigh in on this as well as for, for people out there, they're starting to kind of zoom in and okay, I'm, I'm feeling better about generative AI and learning. Got some experts here that really are saying, okay, I can use this. But do you still have to have that? And I think it tails off of what you just said. Is that Does it still tail off of the idea that you've got to get your subject matter experts back involved at the end? Yeah. I don't think any of you yet, right, have launched a, a course that's 100% created by mm -hmm. generative AI with no double check yeah. whatsoever. So back to that HI issue. Yeah, so I'll answer that question, but I'm also going to piggyback on something that I was going to say in the to the previous panelists. So, you know, I'm an educator and I've created tons of courses. I've taught thousands of people. And one of the things that everyone who's an educator who builds courses know is that there's more than one way to build the same course. Um, so if you were going to build a course on digital marketing, there's a whole different you know, you can take it from the angle of a technology stack. It, it depends on what, which market you're addressing. There's lots of different pathways through the same material. And if you're going to build a course, you know, the traditional way by hand, then usually what you do is you start off by saying, you know, you, you design the course up front and then you basically commit to that design. And then you start building out all the content according to that decision. And one of the things that I found is, is that using Copilot, for example, you can build a course in about... 10 minutes. And, but every time you build, tell the AI to build a course, it will build it differently, which is a huge feature. It's not a bug. So what I would do now as an educator is I would tell the AI to build the same course five times, just right off the bat before I even start fine tuning anything. And almost consistent, you'll find that one of them is the one that really resonates with you, the human, the domain expert. It's like, that is the one that hits the spot. And the AI, I don't think has the capability to figure out that's the one. But as a human, you can say that's the one. But you are able to get to that point of picking between five choices in in an hour. And, and then Graham, when you do that, are, are, are you giving person. are you giving prompts or are you just asking it the same to repeat yeah, the so, exercise? So in Copilot, there's not really any concept of a prompt because the AI is behind the scene. So in Copilot, you get basically get a slide out form and you just tell it what you want, like what's the name of the course. What tone of voice, what language, 50 languages, um, what's the audience? Um, but you can also, it has additional instructions and you can say, I want a course, but give it a, an Avengers theme. And I've done that. And it's, it's quite cool to see it teaching digital marketing using superheroes. But so you, you give it the, essentially the same instructions five times. That's one approach. Um, so there's no promise necessary. Alternatively, you might experiment with three or four different instructions, nudge it this way, nudge it that way. Um, but once again, going back to the original question, it's the human being, the domain expert, the one who's going to have to deliver the course, the one who knows what it's like to take a course. They are the one who are reviewing, making the selection, and then fine tuning it. Have any of you tried uh, your organization's voice in terms of creating it? Like, you now you can use Gen AI and say, do it in the voice of like Mr. DMAP. 
or you know you can do it in the voice of by by experimenting with styles and and approaches that are unique to your organization. We're going to. That's probably the best way to say it uh, because okay. it I, we're in a we're in a uh, an evolution really of what AI can do. And you know every you, you wake up in the morning and you're hearing something else new that's coming out and something else that now is like out there to use. So yeah, absolutely, we are heading in that direction. Um, you know, for me, me to be able to know that my voice can be synthesized and then recreated and and put mm -hmm. out there. Uh, even, um, even, you know, the likeness of my image, right? It's like, how many different things can we do? And, you know, and again, it's like, it, it really becomes that it's an opportunity, right? And, and, um, and, and Dennis, yeah, later yeah. on this year, you are literally going to be able to have voiceovers in your voice in Copilot. Yeah, which I'm so, so excited there's, about, right? Yeah. There's, there's, amazing, <laughs> there's amazing synthetic um, speech AIs that sound really natural. And the one that we're using is one where there's a, a huge palette. I can have a elderly British dignified gentleman, or I can have it sound like a, an American school kid or, you know, whatever's relevant to my course. But the AI that we're using also supports your own voice. So it, all of that stuff is, you know, is well, coming great. very soon. For some of our longer form courses, we have experimented with different voices to really hold the the learner's interest, and that's so we're I'm excited about that kind of idea where you can mix it up and have some different different voices coming in to keep people interested. And, and Michael, to answer your your question, we've experimented not so much with the um, personality side of it as like subject matter expert angle, which which turn in turn gives some personality. If I'm a subject matter expert in a particular field that that seems to adjust the tone for us so it's more degrees versus you know a, 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 a more significant shift um in that area and that that's kept us on point as far as having a a singular voice from from that that subject matter experts perspective last question for the group before we we dive into the into the data is it sounds like you've been through the cycle enough don't mean to put any of you on the spot but are you getting more interesting, better feedback from the first round of Gen AI assisted learning than the learning that you did without have the learners picking up on the difference. Uh, I guess the I, good news is not 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 a lot. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the only thing we've seen um, is that you know our our students are used to uh, a particular way that we deliver the course, which is through videos where they hear our voices. But that is, again, that's what we're going to see is going to be able to, to be new. And then we're going to be able to deliver that. So there, but the content, uh, we've actually rolled out a couple of courses and let some kids try it. And we've had people look at it and they don't know the difference. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing to see because of the style of writing and what they see and the way the content's delivered. Um, you know, for us, though, but knowing that we're going to be able to work on and have our voice synthesized so that we can continue to deliver deliver our product our way. Right. We know that we're headed in that direction. So um, but but content wise, our students, uh, they feel comfortable with what we've originally created and what they're seeing now. Excellent. So let's jump into the registration question. I encourage everyone to still ask questions through chat, but want to show you what you yourselves as as attendees and registrants to the roundtable said about ChatGPT and, and other generative AI tools. So the original question was, how many of you tried it? For the 26% that say no, what's the number one reason why they should? Um, it's just amazing. <laughs> you, don't, <laughs> you don't know what you're It missing. really is. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> It, it, it's it really I would is. say it's like incredible helpful to me. Yeah, my own learning journey, both inside and outside of work. You know, even if I wasn't using it at work, I'd be using it at home. It's like anything that I'm interested in, I can get answers to really, really quickly. Yeah, and and, and, and I'll, I, I'll and I really do truth. think like I, when I first heard about ChatGPT, I had no idea what to expect, and I remember I said, "What's two plus two? Four? Okay." Um, how would you do a square root of this? I started with math. I don't know really why. And then when I got to the point where teach me linear algebra using the Socratic method and it started doing it, it's like, oh my goodness, this is like so far beyond what I was expecting. 
But if you haven't tried it, then you don't really know, don't know what you're missing. Right. I was going to say your, your peers and your competitors are doing it. So you should pay attention. I like that. I like yeah. that one a lot. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And it's it funny. I, I was having a chat with some, um, this, this put, uh, is a, a separate webinar focused on K through 12. And they were asking, and the lot, lots and lots of teachers haven't even used ChatGPT yet. And I was quite candid. I said, like, honestly, a lot of kids actually prefer you, learning using YouTube already, as opposed to what you're teaching in school, they're going to prefer using chat GBT way more than YouTube. So you, a teacher, you really need to figure out how to leverage chat GBT quickly. Otherwise, more and more of your students are going to be tuning you out. Right. It's like sad, but true. Yeah, you know, it, it reminds me of, uh, I, you know, when calculators came out and the graphing calculator came out and it was, you know, 25 years ago, whenever it was. And I was I was one of those classroom teachers, math guys, like we're not using a calculator. We're going to do it the old fashioned way. You need to know how to do this by hand. And I was so resistant. I was the 26 percent. I was the no, I'm not I'm not going to make the I'm not going to look and see until I sat down and I went out. And I just bought one of those uh, graphing calculators and I started to look at what it could do. And what I discovered was that it wasn't about the manual labor of kids going through and graphing and you know doing things. Instead, we actually could have a conversation about looking at what's behind the graph and what's actually happening. So we could have interpretive kind of conversations as opposed to the manual kind. And that's what I see in, 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 the, in generative AI is that what it's doing is it's actually opening up things that for me, it was like, I'm taking the manualness out of it and getting into where we can get into more interpretation and design and creation. And it is just a whole new world out there that, um, but I was resistant, you know, same thing with the calculator. I was like, I'm not gonna do it, I'm old school, there's no way. And then once I got my eyes open to it, it was like, this is a whole new world. And what a difference it's made for our students. It's been huge. Right, good point. Let's, let's go to the next question. So we asked folks what the impression of Genevieve I was, I'm sure everyone remembers. And we basically had three categories, fun tool, but don't see using it, interested in seeing the utility and, and not sure. For the folks that are the fun tool, don't see using it and not sure, how do we get them to move into it? Yeah, it's more than interesting. I think Graham nailed it, which is, it's amazing, right? How do we get them to have this slide become one bar in the middle saying 100%? Mm -hmm. You have to try it. You know, I, I'm going to take a guess that if you're a not sure, you're not sure because you actually haven't tried. Think, go back to my calculator, right? It was what had me say, no, I'm not going to use the calculator is because I hadn't tried it. And I think that's going to be the biggest thing. It's like with anything, it's like, get your hands in there, get in, start playing with it, start seeing what's possible. And that those numbers are going to move and you're going to find yourself in that middle column. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people, when they first heard about generative AI, a lot of people would classify it. Well, it's a really just a sophisticated lookup mechanism. It's just like a better search tool or something like that. Right. And, and they're not really interacting with this thing. And, and when you start having a composite, it's like talking with a, a leading expert in any subject about anything. And this is just ChatGPT4. I mean, so I've I've watched countless videos now with chief scientists from OpenAI and Anthropic and, you know, all the usual suspects. And, you know, they think that AGI, annual general intelligence, is coming sometime in the next 10 years based on their own usage. Now, yeah. I don't know the specific, but the point is, is that it's getting better really fast. Mm -hmm. And well, so not only that, time to start is... learning it is now, because if you get left behind... Uh, that will and, be and there's it, and it's not just um, I mean obviously Cypher's done a great job building a a, a multifaceted tool set that can help build an entire course but there's also a lot of more uh, focused applications and there's now specialty AIs that you know, at least are being the front ends being designed to help you tackle very specific tasks mm -hmm. so I encourage people to go out there and take a look at you know what tools would be most helpful for you and getting started. And it's not necessarily building a whole course. It might be analyzing a data set so that you can interpret that better for a particular course. It start, start small and, and you'll see how it can build into something bigger. Yeah. And in yeah, terms of accessibility, 
So like chat GPT four now is rolling out just voice interface. So you don't even have to type, you can just talk with it and it'll talk back to you. And I've got a six year old boy and he's gonna love this stuff because he'll be able to learn about astronomy and galaxies and all this stuff just by chit chatting, just like he's talking with one of his friends. I'll throw out one that we that we see in working with organizations that are incorporating it, which hasn't been brought up, which is people are actually starting to figure out that there may be things that they don't know about the subject, that now they're learning about the subject. So this whole idea of subject matter expert without Gen AI, you could be producing content that isn't the most relevant and isn't the most in the know. You know, and pulling from the world in on what uh, the latest of what's going on, many professionals are finding that it's improving the value of the content because it goes beyond what they know. You know, how can you know everything at any given time and what the latest developments are? So let's hope that we can, uh, the next time we do this, we'll see the 100% in the middle bar. <laughs> let's go to the, the next slide. I think we might have more questions coming in, Matt, do we? Yeah, we got a couple uh, that have, that have um, popped up, sorry backed up on back the slide up at the same time um one one of the questions that came up is can the panel recommend some tools to explore if folks are on the front end of this journey where do we start what do we look at first i mean we've talked about chat gpt that's sort of the 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 the, the default i guess well what I'm others bias would, would <laughs> recommend so I'm biased because I'm the founder of Cypher Learning, but <laughs> if you're in the in the business of building pre, um, educational content, I think we're probably the best solution right now. So if you go to cypherlearning.com, you can actually see how we build courses on almost anything. And it's quite sophisticated behind the scenes, by the way. It's not just one AI doing it. There's like multiple AIs. If you weren't going to build a course by hand, you would be typing in around 200 prompts in order to get everything that you needed to build a course. But, you know, that's just in the world of e-learning. You know, I'm sure, you know, the other guys know better about vertical AIs for math and other subjects. Well, it's interesting you bring that up, Graham, because I think it fits well into the slide we're looking at, which is the vast majority of you weighed in on the bottom part of the stats. So you've got basically one out of three, one out of two people saying that. Aside from everything that we've said, you can significantly improve the response rate to questions and inquiries. We all know that we spend a lot of time creating learning, and the moment we put it out there, we're inundated with questions from the learners. Yeah. And we can give them instant response now. We can create instant feedback loops. And the other one that I love, and I think this is back to what you were getting at, Graham, is that creating learning at scale personalized is super hard. And if we can get a tool like this going and see that reduce in efficiency and effectiveness and learning, I mean, this is a heavy lifting product and, and what you've incorporated into your platform and, you know, literally without putting words in your mouth, I've watched it, you know, you can create learning in a matter of 10 minutes or less, yeah. you know, right before your eyes. So that, that's, that's a breakthrough as far and the as. The other thing I'm, I'm going to mention, I don't want too much of a sales pitch, but the cost to our end customers is about $5 to create a course. So it's not one of these things that, oh, well, you built it in 10 minutes, but it cost me $10,000, like $5. So you can have five, five versions of the same course for 25 bucks. It's amazing. Yeah, great, yeah. great point. I mean, whereas you might have turned to Upwork or something else before to, to get an instruction designer for, you know, a, 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 uh, an immediate need, like you said, for, for a fraction of, of what you'd pay, you now have an opportunity to get, get a jump start. Yeah. That's <laughs> uh Let's go to the, the, the next slide and let's talk about, I think we're clear. This is a really interesting one. I think we need a little bit of time here and I want to be cognizant of our time together. But we asked about challenges because everyone always wants to talk about the challenges. And it was really interesting. We were talking about this before we started the round table today is about one out of three people are feeling towards you know the right-hand side of the graph that they, they, they're, they're challenged with what can I actually create as reasonable expectations? Like I don't want to overpromise Gen AI and learning to my organization. How do I stay on top of the tech advances? And we just saw the live question of, you know, what's even the name of these things and 
how do I learn more about cipher learning? And then the source and the level of expertise. And I think the last one I'd like to start with first, which is to the three of you, and particularly the, the practitioners and Matt and, and Dennis, have you had to create a new level of skills and competencies within your learning team to use Gen AI effectively or products like Cypher Learning in particular, which you know I went through a briefing with Graham and his team. It seems like anyone can jump in and start creating really great content and there's no learning curve. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I give Cypher kudos for that. It's the, it, it takes very little effort to get started there. Um, and, and like Graham said, iterating, you know, having, creating different versions of something and um, comparing those and, and trying to find which one has the, the best match for your voice uh, is, is really easy. Um, so that, that's, that's great. Outside of that, uh, sure, it takes takes some practice, and I think what we said at the beginning about having conversation, asking different questions, um, really building on the prior knowledge, because everything that you um, ask a question about is just additional reference for the next question, and I find that that's really a great way to um, refine and explore new areas is by just keeping the conversation going and, and asking about things that, that have come up in prior chats. Yeah, it, it, for us using Copilot, it you know to to train my staff on it. Literally, by the time I'm done showing them how I set up a course, they're fully trained. I mean, <laughs> it's like the whole thing's <laughs> about ten minutes, right? Um, one thing that I can that I can also say about how you know how Graham and his team have taken this on from Cipher Learning, and is that it and it comes back to the AI HI conversation because what happens is that we're using it we're seeing what's working and we're seeing things. And then Cypher Learning is coming back and saying, what else would you like to see? And how else can you use this? And what kind of tools can you see? So they're looking from us as people that are using this for our customers, for our students and for ourselves to create the content. What else do we need? And that's why we can keep to see how this thing continues. We know that it's going to be growing. We know that it's going to be, you know, it's going to be, uh, be evolutionizing itself right this whole evolution of what this is but it's we're able to participate in the conversation of what's working for us what do we like to see what's not working and you know from there it's like and then how can we come back and then how can we work together and oftentimes too it's even just a question of oh if it just did this and the it comes back it's like well it does do that you just missed that button you know it's like oh okay well let me turn that on and so it it, it is something that it takes the collaboration between between the people that you're working with, but also, but playing with it and seeing. But for us to be able to, the original question about being able to, you know, how hard is it for our staff to learn this? Super easy. I mean, just, yeah. you know, yeah. click that's, on the button and creating it. Because I know one of the areas that I would love to see evolve is a more conversational approach to developing a course, um, especially through speech. So it might, you might say, hey, give me a, give me a course. And, and it gives you the first one you go, you know, paragraph three, can you just make it a little bit clearer? Or I don't think this page is really explaining X very well. Show me another version. Or let's just jazz up module five and then move it before module two, you know? So, you know, right now we're focused on build the course or add a new module or whatever else. But I would love to see a more iterative, collaborative, conversational approach. Yeah. And I think the, the best of breed approach that you're taking really is, I'm, I'm amazed at how fast it's evolved. Uh, that that you know been around software development for a long time, and this is breakneck speed that that we're seeing here. Thanks. Yeah, and it gets yeah, I think, over time. Yeah, and Michael, I think from a from a more broad perspective, if you're if 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 you're sitting here listening to all of this and you're going, I've been I've been waiting to dip my toe in the water. The lessons learned from myself as a practitioner, I was. You know, AI has really come to to the forefront in the year that I've been working with Brandon Hall Group. So uh, wasn't around when I was really in the trenches on the learning operations and learning development side. But what I would say is um, it's not search engine and don't treat it like a search engine. And I think you'll you'll get more comfortable with it faster mm. by by changing your mindset because when you start out i would i would ask it i would type in search terms kind of the same way i would in a 
in a search engine. And it, and it took me a lot longer to get to a place where I was understanding how it could just answer my question. And just just ask the question. Don't think about how you're wording the question. Don't over engineer the question. Just ask the question, and let right. and let that conversation overflow. Let's uh, let's wrap on our last slide, and uh, I think it's this conversation's been outstanding. We've talked about all the different approaches and uses and best practices. It's interesting that one out of two of our audience believes that enhancing, accelerating, scaling, learning content development. With your final thoughts on that, you know, what is the what is the promise? What is the promise that we can make as people that may be farther along than a, a good number of people in our audience? What's the promise that we can make if people get off this round table today and say, you know what? I'm that person on the fence or I'm the person who ever tried it or I'm the one that you know had these, all these challenges. What do you want them to do first in this content development process to learn about generative AI? What would be the first step? Well, putting on my cycle learning hat, I build a course using Copilot. And the, the, the Copilot, the current version is focused on the upper right-hand side, accelerating and scaling Con, you know, creation of educational content. And if you look at, you know, within a typical organization, some of that content is going to be built by the L&D team who are usually overwhelmed. So this is actually a, like a, a great assistance for them. And you've got people in line of business who maybe, hey, the L&D guys are overwhelmed. I'm just going to build a course on improving sales myself. So I think the upper right hand makes complete sense. That's kind of what you would expect. Cypher so Learning in Q1 are going to be delivering on the lower left quadrant. So I'm glad that when you add them together, it is 83%. That makes me happy, <laughs> which is allowing learners to le le leverage gener generative AI to answer their questions and get expert advice in real time without necessarily having to involve L&D or any kind of traditional course development. Yeah, I, I think taking a course you already have as um, illustrate or as you shared earlier, um, taking a course you produced before and reproducing it to see what you get, to see, you know, which kind of pulls you down to that lower left corner. How can it be improved? What what are the gaps? Um, what what makes it more current, more relevant for your audience? Yeah, I, I think the other thing is you because I'm in the, I'm I always I'm going to move to that 30% improving the learner experience. I'm always interested in how do we take care of our customers? How do we take care of our students? And one of the things, if you're trying to figure out how to get started, find out from the people that you're serving, what do they want? What do they need? Because that will point you in a direction of where to go. You're, you're, the people using your programs, the people using your content, your courses, they're going to let you know what's important to them. And knowing what's important to them, if you can come back and deliver on what's important to them, but they're going to give you the direction of where to look and where and what to look for. Um, <laughs> Cypher learning is like the place to go, you know. Um, and if you're not there, then the the baby steps on your way. But but it's um, you know finding out from your uh, from your from your own customer base what's important to them. Well, I want to end it here and say, I hope you've now become a friend of generative <laughs> AI and learning, and we're no longer a foe. I can't thank enough Graham and Dennis and Matt for joining us today and also Matt Pimmon from, from our team, Principal Analyst, great insights and, and great work and, and answering and, and helping along with those questions. We know that this is the end of the beginning. I uh, want to give a big thank you. Shout out to our audience. Please check out Cypher Learning. I think they're one of the organizations out there that are really trying to not just enhance the ability to do all this, but uh, a true understanding of a comfortable and forthright way of doing it within your organization. But again, we could talk about this all day. I'm intrigued. I've learned a lot. I hope everyone in the audience has learned a lot. And we look forward to uh, speaking with you soon. If you have any questions, you know where to find us at brandonhallgroup.com and Cypher Learning. Thank you very much. And we look forward to chatting with you in the future. Good luck with your Gen AI experience. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.